morning, everyone. Next week, we'll be listening to a lecture by one of our graduates, Jose Pagan, who will tell us about how you should stay in school forever because the outside real world is torture. You actually have to meet deadlines. You're going to just play around. You have to actually commit yourself to doing some work. You have to actually show up. All of these are inconveniences of great degree. So you will hear this story next Thursday. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Sylvia Figueira from San Jose University. And I would like us to welcome her warmly. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm a professor in computer engineering at Santa Clara University. I'm also part of a Frugal Innovation Lab and, and head of the mobile lab within that lab. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Basically, we build applications to help emerging, mar in emerging markets in underserved communities. And it turns out everybody has a phone nowadays, so we're trying to you know, make use of that phone, you know, basically to help some needs. And that, you know, is my talk. The kind of help that we're actually doing. How many of you are computer science students here? Most people? Cool, okay. So, with that idea in mind, I'm part of the Frugo Innovation Lab. That's like one of our main labs right now. Our director is Radha Basu. She came up with this idea that um, you can use engineering nowadays to actually help in other places, emerging markets, and and the whole idea is to develop and adapt or adapt technology for these places. So it's not like making, and this is a whole engineering thing, it's not just computing. The whole idea is not to just make something cheap and sell in, a, like in Africa. The whole idea is to basically adapt the technology, reinvent it sometimes so that it actually fits the needs of the population there. And this is what the Frugal Innovation is all about. We have three main eyes, I guess. Instruction, innovation, and immersion. So, you know, we teach the students about you know, the whole idea of frugal innovation and, and how, you know, to adapt or reinvent technology for these places. And then they participate in projects, and some of them actually go to places to deploy this technology. So, we have been doing this for like three to four years, and it's actually growing a lot these days, especially in my part. So, when you think about frugal innovation, you know, the lab came up with a a set of core competencies. What's frugal innovation anyways? How do you adapt technology? What, what makes it frugal? And again, frugal, not the same as just making it cheaper and simpler. It's actually making it fit into the needs. So going around just for you to get, have an idea, starting in the red one over there, it needs to be rugged because sometimes, you know, weird things are going to happen to whatever device you're coming up with. So we need to make it really robust and and so that it can get wet or get step it upon and stuff like that. It needs to be human centric. Basically, it needs to the technology needs to be developed with the you know the people in mind, not just you know, to make money, but it needs to fit what the people need. It needs to be simple. Complicated things just are not gonna be useful in certain places. It needs to be local. It need, most of the time, it's really key to actually use local resources for the technology. You don't want to be important from other places. You want you know, things that are going to be using the resources from the local community. Of course, it needs to be affordable. In some of these places, people make way less money than, than we are used to. So things, if, if it's really expensive, it's just not going to happen. It needs to be green. Some of these places are off the grid. They don't have power, or they have power some parts of the day. And so you cannot count that and electricity is going to be there all the time. It needs to be lightweight because sometimes it's going to be carried and if it's heavy, it's not going to work. It needs to be adaptable. Basically, you have to adapt to different languages sometimes and to different usages and little things may actually help you to sell in different neighborhoods or different communities. Last to my distribution is another important one. These people in some of these villages, they don't have access to a TV. Here, you know, you come up with a new technology and it's on TV the next day and everybody knows about it. Or, you know, on the web. These people don't have that. So if you want to sell something, you actually have to go all the way to people to show them. Check it out, I have this and it may help you to do that. So this is the last mile distribution. You have to actually go to the customer. So this kind of gives you an idea that the technology needs to be different than what we're used to. The last one, in, that we have here is mobile. 
So phones are everywhere and they're helping a lot. So it's actually really important for, for different technologies to actually use the idea that you know, the phone may be an interface for that or the phone may be helping a business because they don't have computers or Wi-Fi, so the phones may actually be substituted in that. So these are the main set, the main set of, of ideas that usually this frugal innovation actually helps. So by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand because, yeah, it's all good. Okay, if this idea of mobile in mind, that's me. I'm the head of the mobile computer lab, which is a lab within the lab. So inside the frugal innovation lab, I have this mobile lab, which basically does mobile solutions for emerging markets and underserved communities, communities that actually doesn't don't have access to you know the same things that we are used to, like Wi-Fi all the time and computers everywhere and stuff like that. The reality is, phones are everywhere nowadays, more than we can imagine. Everybody has a phone, and I'm going to show you some numbers that will show you that. But there are lots of constraints. It's again not the same. We expect right now, right, to have a smartphone and Wi-Fi 24-7 and access to the internet all the time, everywhere. When it's off, it's actually annoying. If you're in a place and there's no signal, ah, oh God. So we kind of take that for granted. It's not the same in some of these places. So different, there are different constraints. First of all, power. Some of these people cannot plug their phone every night. So you have to kind of take that into account. Connectivity. Sometimes there's no Wi-Fi and a lot of the projects we do is based on, based on SMS because that's all they have. The phones are simpler. Not Smartphones are not everywhere yet. So we deal with some simpler phones that we call feature phones in some places. They are not like a total dumb phone, but doesn't have they don't have the same capabilities as a smartphone. And there's restricted access to data and Wi-Fi. Sometimes you only have like text and just text with text, not pictures, anything like that. So the constraints are very different. Just to show you an idea of what's going on in, in the mobile scenario, and you probably heard about that before. The the phone, the mobile phones basically they they have a, a reach that is like unprecedented. There, no other technology has had the same kind of reach. A lot, the phones are going everywhere, and Wi-Fi signal is is spreading like crazy, and even like connectivity is spreading like crazy. So just to give you an idea, from 2003 to 2010, it's like a seven year seven years spread, we went from 61% to 90% of access to mobile cell signal, which is an amazing like, you know, change in a short period of time. If you see, look at that graph, I know, kind of, but the green line is the global population, okay? So this is 1900 and all the way to 2015, which is like a projection. The green area here is the fixed line subscription, that's the growth. The blue is the kind of like the mobile subscription amount. So you can see that this is the population and this is the growth of where the mobile actually signature signal is going. It's an amazing, an amazing growth. Turns out that number shows that 75% of the world has access to a solar phone right now and it's actually growing. So we're probably gonna, you know, getting pretty close to a place where almost everybody has access to a phone. So it's a Pretty impressive piece of technology, and it's like an interesting time to actually use that technology, you know, to help some of these communities that, you know, otherwise wouldn't have access to communication information and things like that. And you don't need to go across the globe. You can actually look around in our own neighborhood, and there's some interesting numbers. So, CTA is an organization in San Jose, South Bay, that actually uses technology to serve homeless people. They did some some research and interviewed people on the street in San Jose where there's about like 5,000 homeless people. And they interviewed a lot of people and realized that they are already using phones for lots of different things. 65% use phones for searching for a job and 71% of the disability people actually have a mobile phone. And they found out that 69% of these people actually own a cellular phone. So the homeless people actually, a large percentage of them have a cellular phone. And 54% of those people, about half of the people with a phone, actually have data access. So they actually have access to data when you know they're using their phone. This is a pretty impressive number. So we start you know working on projects to actually use that information or use that capability to you know build things that actually help them because the needs are different than the needs of you know the people that we are usually dealing with or the people for 
boom, you know, most people develop apps that are on the item store and stuff like that. Okay, so phones basically are helping people everywhere. That's the reality. It's happening and it's like incredible the kind of projects and the kind of ideas that people have. So these are some examples. M Farm is a, a little company in Kenya founded by some very young women that they saw that the farmers were really isolated, but they actually have these phones. So they came up with this idea that, you know, they came up with this app that enabled the farmers to actually communicate so that they know what everybody else is planting, what the prices they are charging, and they, you know, use that information to actually do a better job and make more money and help each other, actually. Another fa famous one is Mpesa. This is mobile banking in Kenya and Tanzania. So people had to walk, in some villages, they had to walk a lot to actually go to a bank to actually get money. So this, this, <coughs> Little company came up with this idea of mobile money, and basically all the transactions are done with you know these feature phones now, and the people don't have to walk all the way to the bank all the time to get money. And this is Mpesa is like one that is actually growing a lot. You may have heard of that. Frontline SMS is another another little and enterprise that actually grew a lot. They start using like SMS to broadcast disaster information in Asia. So there was one big storm that it would hit and there was all these people who live far away and there was no way to reach to them and basically they came up with this so that they could actually send a text message really fast everybody saying it's coming you know go get out this is the route to actually get out and, and send information around since then from line sms is actually growing a lot and a lot of tools are using that just to send sms in, in different places in the world open mrs is another one that was created for managing health information and it's right now is used in Uganda as like the standard for collecting information. The, the problem was that in some of these villages they don't have a clinic or a hospital so they have a bunch of, of kind of like health mm, clinics and a health worker goes around in the village is actually you know, taking care of people and they come back but there was no way to keep information so they would go check on people give them medicine and come back. Next month, and they would come again, they would forget everything and what that person had and stuff like that. So somebody came up with this idea of, you know, using a phone to grab information and the phone sends back the information to a database. So next time the person comes, they can actually download the information about the patient and remember. And probably thinking, don't the hospitals do that already? Yeah, they do. And the hospitals you guys go to. But in these places, there was no such a thing. So this was like a big actually step so that you know next time the person came we could remember what the person had before which was not there before so the phones are actually helping to collect information and send back to a database any questions so far it's all good okay so what do we do in this scenario we do lots of projects to either you know come up with new ideas or helping some of these little companies that are doing something good so I have a course in the spring called Mobile Projects for Social Benefit, and some of the projects start from that course. So basically, give students some ideas and go from there, and also run projects with you know in lots of different styles. So senior design projects, all the seniors in Santa Clara have to have like a senior project. Some of them will do in that area, or independent projects. And a lot of the students do summer research projects. So they stay in Santa Clara for the summer, working in you know some of these. And these are the projects that I'm gonna kind of talk about. There's, right now, there's three lines of projects that we are working on. One is basically helping homeless people. We do a lot of those because we met these, you know, folks from CTA and they already work with homeless people, so they have lots of interesting ideas on how to help them. We also help social enterprises, and I'm going to talk a little about that, and also <coughs> develop kind of like apps to interface the device so that they become simpler and cheaper. So I'm going to give some examples on the projects that we actually do. Okay, homeless people. Yeah. It turns out that cellular phones are a powerful tool to basically get people out of poverty. Every time I talk about this in places, people look at me like, first of all, homeless people don't have phones. And no, yeah, actually they have, and I showed it out. And then they think they have all the questions about how do they charge it and how do they pay? And there are always lots of questions because you know people are not used to thinking of homeless people as people who have some money. These people, most of them, they are not moneyless. They're just homeless. They sometimes have a job. They just don't have enough to pay for a house at that moment. So there are lots of families on the streets because, you know, the dad lost the job and they were like on a month by month kind of basis and suddenly they don't have money for the house anymore. So they are on the street, but they actually have money. 
very little money. But it, the, having the phone is so important that some of them will eat lambs to pay to be able to actually use the phone. Because if you think about it, how do you get a job if you don't have a phone? How do people call you back you know, for an interview? So how do you browse the internet to actually find jobs? So phones basically are a very strong toolkit to get people back on track and get people a job and a house and out of the streets. So after realizing that, we've kind of have been helping CTA to come up with like ideas on how to help people with phones by using the phone. So uh, basically the main information here is that a large number of digital knowledge people have the phones and they really rely on them. So basically to connect with family and friends and there is a study that shows that the, the people who actually have the phones actually have less of a problem of depression because they keep in touch with family. So they don't go like all alone and, and yeah. So this is an important part of the whole having a phone. To ask for help, you know, there are problems on the streets. Believe it or not, people actually rob homeless people so, or beat them up, weird stuff. So they can ask for help if they have a phone. To find shelter and to find jobs and housing and other things. So having a phone is a pretty big deal for them because they don't have any other way to connect with, like, you know, the world. So all these things actually help us to come up with some solutions that actually may help them even further. Because they don't have the same needs that we actually do, right? They, their needs are different. They probably not gonna play a game or they're not gonna be on Facebook a lot or tweeting or something like that. They really want to be able to receive calls and call. They wanna, you know, to have access to texting and browsing is really important for them basically to find jobs and things like that. So one, the first project that we did for CTA, we call Street Connect, is an announcement tool. This is a collaboration with CS in Santa Clara and CTA. So this is a tool to enable service providers to send announcements to homeless people. So after talking to them, we realized that one problem that this, there's a lot of service providers, organizations that provide service like shelters and meals to homeless people in the Bay Area and I guess everywhere. So they had a hard time communicating with these people like you know if I'm a, I have a shelter and it's really cold tonight and I actually have a bunch of beds that are actually open how do I tell people that you know I actually have them or another important one was when they have to cancel an event some of these people will be on a bus two hours to actually go to this place because there's gonna be a job fair and the job fair got canceled and they didn't know so they went on the bus for a couple of hours to get there and you know there wasn't so canceling events was also one of these you know important events that they need to communicate to people and job fairs, and, and there's also a health van. So they wanted to be able to send this message saying, you know, here, something is happening. So we came up with this idea of an announcement tool. Basically, there is a website where the, these organizations register, and they can actually send announcements to people who are registered. So, yeah, this is the idea. The service providers, these organizations, and the user, they need to register in the system so that the system actually, you know, know how to basically find the homeless people and also can actually authenticate the service provider. We don't want other people sending messages just for fun because people do that. So users can select the kind of things that they want to receive information on. So they can actually, when they register, if I'm a homeless person and I log in, I can say I only want information about food or I only want information about shelter or I only want information in this zip code. So I can actually tailor so that I don't keep receiving all kinds of things. Because, you know, sometimes they pay for this tax. So we want them to be able to actually decrease the number of tax that are useless. So they can basically tell the system what they want to receive. And they can also limit the number of text messages. So if, you know, I have a limit and I'm already kind of like getting to my limit this month, I can actually stop it right now and say no more this month because, yeah, I don't want to be over my limit. So basically, it looks like that. It's a website, and there's a lot of functionality. But the main idea is that you enter the information in there, and it gets broadcast to everybody who wants to receive that message in that zip code. Okay. Yeah. And it basically goes as a just a text message, and the users can actually register by just sending a text to a number. And they send like, and then they can say food, and they can tag shelter and a zip code, and basically the kind of like the settings created so that they only receive those. So they can change the settings through text. Another homeless project that we did was a senior project last year, and we called it Youth Street Connect. And this is a collaboration with an organization called YTH in Oakland. They 
I also use technology to help, especially young women in Oakland. So this is a tool to help with health pre-screening and resource finding. <coughs> and the important usage is basically in the prevention and early detection of STD. So they wanted, these people came up to us and they wanted to be able to kind of reach out to these people and help them out. Some of these women, they don't want to be found. They don't want nobody, people to actually know that they are even there on the street or their name or anything like that. So it's really how, uh, hard to actually reach out to them. So they came, we came up with this system that actually helped them with that. It's like a collaboration. So this is the idea. When a young homeless woman go to one of these clinics that actually accept homeless people, the doctors use a questionnaire to help raise red flags. So there is like a tablet with a bunch of questions on behavior and you know kind of lifestyle that they answer. And then you know there is a like red flag that may be raised to say this is a person at risk. So pay attention to her. And then basically the patient is going to register to the system. Going to give going to be given the option to actually register to the system and receive an app with tools and resources. So this is kind of like using this questionnaire and these clinics that are participating to try to get these people in the system so that they can reach out to them later on. So after that, the person actually has the app. The app is going to enable them to find important resources like clinics and clothing and stuff like that. And the registration in the system enables YTH to actually send messages and announcements and reminders and stuff like that to these people. So they actually they are now in the system and they can actually connect that. One question people ask usually is why would they go to the clinic? These clinics, this is basically, you know, they have like a sore throat and a fever or something, and they go to a clinic because of that, and they, you know, they're homeless. So they are high risk because of that reason, and they get the questionnaire based on that. So they went to the clinic for something else totally different, but YTH and these clinics actually use that to get them in the system. This is the app that they came up with. Those are two screens on the left. Basically, whenever they log in, they get like a list of the kinds of resources that are available. So clothing, employment, food, and so on. They also have a list of the ones that are nearby right now. So these are like clothing and employment, and a, a, a list of them of the closest to ones for where they are. If they click on one of them, you know, they get a map and information where they are, and also a rating. So they can actually say if this was a good place or not. And the, they can also ask, actually kind of ask to rate, so they get like a screen like that, where they can actually say how many, how many stars this, this place has, and, you know, enter information on how was the, how was the, the service. So they basically are going to be able to actually pass on information on how useful they are. It's kind of like a Yelp, but very tailored to, you know, the kind of service providers that they need. And for people who are at risk like they are. Another project related to homeless people is GOLO. It was also a senior project last year. And this is like a research project on getting phones to a very low power mode. And this is also a collaboration with CTA. And basically it's a tool the whole idea at the end is to actually have a button that you press and the phone goes really low power. Just because homeless people don't have sometimes a place to charge their phones every night. So maybe, you know, if the phone's almost dying, they want to go really low power, just keep, you know, a very little set of resources alive so that the battery goes longer. CTA has been working really hard to actually, because they see the importance for homeless people to actually have these phones, they have been working with lots of organizations to actually get more people with phones. They just got a collaboration with Google, and they're going to donate like a thousand smartphones for homeless people. And we're going to try to put this app in all these phones so that they already receive this phone with a button that can make it go really low power. So there's a lot of interest in actually having these people have phones because, you know, they understand that that helps them out of the street, which, you know, is the ultimate goal in English, to empower people to go back to regular life. So more about goal. Basically, this is a research-based project. The students were trying to identify how to, you know, how to get the phone in a very low power, but it still provide the kind of service that were required. So after talking to CTA and learning more about it, we identified that the, most, the two most important things that 
these people need is basically calling and receiving SMS and web browsing. Those are the two main areas. Everything else we don't really care that much about. So they came up with two strategies to actually go low power. One is underclocking, so basically make the CPU and the phone go as low as possible because you don't need a lot of power to actually call or receive text. However, you do need some to browse. So they made they after some experimenting. They realized that, yeah, you can go really low power, but your browsing experience is going to be kind of slow. But if you really want to save it so that, you know, it goes until next day, for example, when you are going to have access to, like, uh, energy, then, you know, it's an option. The, the browsing is going to be a little slower than we'd like. Also, lowering the screen definition is another one. So they came up with, like, a, it's called, a, it, this was done for the Android. And then Android has, like, a driver called Gover Governor, and they came up with one that, makes the phone go into a very low power state. Okay, current outcomes in these, in these projects basically should connect the one with the announcement. We actually have deployed at Sacred Heart in San Jose. Sacred Heart is a very big organization that provides service for homeless people. They are using our system and, and their feedback, so we've been kind of tuning it up. The youth is to connect the one for the homeless women. Basically, the design that the students came up with was part of a proposal submit to NIH by YTH. We're waiting for that. And if you get the grant, you're going to be deploying in Oakland at some of the clinics that they actually have connection with. So these are actually systems that are going to be used. And because of all these projects, we end up having like a hackathon in February, which was like an amazing experience for us. So the students called that Hack for the Homeless. And it was in February. And it was an amazing event. So. Santa Clara has a week in February that they call Homelessness Awareness Week. So basically it's a whole week dedicated to educating people on what it's like to be a homeless person. So they have people come and give talks, they have some camp outs that people spend the night in kind of like a similar situation than other people who are camping in other places. And so basically the whole idea is understanding what it's like. And so we decided that we wanted to be a part of that. So our hackathon was actually at the last day of that week. This was organized by our ACM and ACMW chapter, so they actually worked really hard to actually put this together. And the goal was to develop mobile solutions for homeless people. I was really surprised to see that there was a huge interest from industry, and we got money from Vodafone and from Do, and Microsoft gave us phones, and Western Digital gave us also money. So there was a lot of the in local industry in the Valley was really, they were really interested in actually coming and participating. Actually, in Microsoft, I was surprised they came to the hackathon and stayed there and helped their students to develop the app for their phone. So it was a, a very interesting kind of like day. How did that happen? It was basically a 24 hour, 24 hour coding experience. The students came into, you know, this is a building in Santa Clara. They stay there for the night. And we gave them some ideas on what to do, some health-oriented mobile solutions for homeless. But they, some of them had their own, and they come up with like very interesting ideas. And we had some judges from the local industry as well, and homeless associations that came to judge. The first prize was uh, called Homeless Helpline, and this was a uh, Santa Clara senior. And he basically created a voice interface for this database that CTA has with information about homeless people and, and, their, and the service that are provided for them. The whole idea is that the user calls a number, so this is not even like uh, just an app per se, it's more like a, a system with a voice kind of connection. So we actually call a number, and then the user is prompted to enter a zip code and the desired service, like on food. And then a text message comes back after that saying, you know, where you are, these are the kinds of you know, options that you have for phone or something like that. And InVision in Santa Clara Valley is actually interested in deploying that, so we've been talking to them about that. Another idea is the Care Buddy. And this was a, a group of, of master students. And also, this ties up to, with the database. They actually have services and enable people to actually ask for information. And that's the screen they came up with. And basically, it ties into Google Maps so that you can find the location and allow restaurants and other organizations to basically post promotions and advertisements. So that was the second prize. Okay, moving on to our second. Any questions about homeless and phones? And okay, so our second area of projects is social enterprises. So social enterprises are usually little companies, although some of them are actually growing. 
that are sustainable. So they are real companies. They actually are for profit. They make money. They have to be on their own. They are not based on donations or grants. But they provide some kind of social service, typically in emerging markets. So, you know, like I said in the beginning, M Farm is, is a social enterprise. So basically these women saw the need that the, the community had and came up with a company actually to provide for that need. They basically sell a service, so they still make money, but they are providing some kind of, of solution for a problem. So we know a lot of these social enterprises through the Center for Science, Technology, and Society in Santa Clara. So we have this center that actually has a, pro a program called Global Social Benefit Institute. So they basically bring about 15 of these social enterprises from other countries into Santa Clara campus every August to help them to become a better company, to help them to do marketing, to do a better business, to go out for funding. So basically it's a business kind of, kind of idea. And they also have a GSBF program where they send students actually in the summer to the social enterprises to help them out by doing some kinds Sometimes a marketing research or an analysis of data, or sometimes you know it's computing people and they go to try you know to deploy some software or something like that. So through G Center, we actually meet a lot of the social enterprises and they come to our lab and we try to come up with some kind of solution that will help them do better job. The other, the other place where we actually meet these people is the Tech Award laureate. So the Tech is a museum in San Jose that actually every year give a prize to some of the social enterprises because they did a good you know, social benefit somewhere. So meeting these people have enabled us to actually kind of deliver to their needs. The whole idea is that some of the social enterprises, they are in places where there's no computers, there's no Wi-Fi. So for them to scale, you know, how do you scale that? So we, we think in business, we think, yeah, database, computers, you know, why Ethernet. That's not the case. So how do you use the phone to actually replace the computer and sometimes only SMS to actually send information about sales, sales and, and distribution and stuff like that. And that's where we have been helping them. To use the phone where there's no computer and to use SMS where there's no Wi-Fi to basically enable them to scale their business to a larger population. I'm not a business person, so yeah. Hopefully you get the picture. So the first project, well, not the first, but one of them that we did, which is called Tax to Learn, and this was a senior project last year. So this was inspired by one, a social enterprise I met in India. These two students actually, one went to India and the other one went to Nepal last summer through the GSBF program. And they helped in different ways in the social enterprises, and they learned that one really important thing and really hard to accomplish in some of these spaces were training people for jobs. It's mm -hmm. like, he, they were trying, they were actually helping to train people and teaching HTML to a set of women in Calcutta. And they saw the need for, you know, some kind of tool to distribute training information. So that's what text to learn is. Basically, it's like a website where the trainer actually enters information, which is sent out for people who are registered. They actually receive in any kind of phone that they have through SMS. And there is a quiz at the end, and they answer back, and then, you know, in the database, you keep track of how they are doing, what they learn, and how the scores they got, and stuff like that. The important thing, you need to use technology available in these emerging markets. So it's not like we do whatever we want and how we want. We actually talk to people, understand how it is, where they are, and we try to really adapt and, and develop the solution for them. So this was the idea. Why SMS? Because some of these people don't have access to SMS. So the whole training material had to go into SMS. Whenever I talk about this to people, they say, how you're gonna read like training material in SMS? Isn't that really annoying? Yeah, I think so, but when that's the only thing you have, that's gonna do it. So, and that's what happens. There are you know, kids in, in Africa who read on you know, phones who which don't have SMS. So, you know, it's better than nothing, way, way better than nothing. So here, we use the SMS for that reason. So this is a snapshot of their, of their tool. Basically, this is the page where you add the training material. It goes through, uh, through SMS to everybody who is registered for that training material. And after that, there is a quiz, and they answer back with the answers. And then the database will keep track of everybody who is doing what and how. Another one, 
another project helping social enterprises we call the Have I Need, and this is inspired by Banana Mobile in South Africa. So Banana Mobile have like a, a set of financial tools, all mobile based and SMS based, that and they run in South Africa. We talked to them and they thought that this was something that would be really useful. So just kind of like an eBay idea, except that these people don't trust other people. They only trust people in their whole neighborhood. So they wanted to have like a tool that enabled them to exchange things or, you know, sell and buy things from within their own set of friends. So it's kind of like a private eBay situation. So the important thing is that it has a very, very simple interface because some of the phones are simple and should work on feature phones. So a lot of the things we have been doing in my lab lately basically is based on feature phones because that's, that's what most people have right now. Even though your smartphones are, are growing a lot and I'm sure in a short period of time you're gonna have smartphones all over the world, it's not like that yet. So if you wanna help people right now, you have to work with feature phones uh, in several projects. So this one was done so that you could go on a feature phone. And this is the idea. That's a snapshot of the app. They enable users to basically form this private community. It's based on a list of friends, and the request needs to be approved to be in that list. And you can basically post items, and you can browse items that other people are, are ex ready to exchange, the exchange, borrow, loan, and, and etc. So this is basically a, a private setting of, of things. The third set of projects are basically interfaces for devices. The idea is basically using cellular phones to replace exp expensive devices. This is actually spreading a lot right now. We can actually buy these things here anyways. When I started doing this three years ago, it wasn't like that at all. But now you can actually go to the Apple store and buy some of these things or order them on the internet. So this is an example of an echocardiogram where the interface is on a phone and an ultrasound over there. So there's a bunch of these examples now where Basically, you have some kind of device connected to the phone, and the interface is on the phone instead of a big computer with a big screen. So that enables things to be affordable and mobile, which are really important in emerging markets. So some of these clinics in you know the middle of nowhere in Africa might not have like a ultrasound machine, but might have that because that's a lot cheaper because of the phone, and the phones are right available anyway. So it, you know the cost is just to buy you know the piece that we actually do the ultrasound. So these kind of interface is enabling a lot of places to actually have devices that they wouldn't otherwise, because it makes them way more affordable. So we did some projects like that, and, and this is one of them, H2O Bot, which, which was a senior project. This is a collaboration with computer science, web design, and the Mac in Santa Clara last year. Basically, the idea was to use this mobile system to turn a tablet into a robot interface. So instead of actually using a joystick to control a robot, use a tablet for that. Advantage is basically easy to adapt to different robots instead of having to buy different kinds of, of joysticks, which are expensive, and also to incorporate a large set of features. You can actually do whatever you want with the tablet because you're going to be basically you know, changing the code. So when you have the joystick, it's not that simple. So this is the idea. The Android talks to an Arduino <coughs> board, which talks to the robot. So we kind of finished phase one where you can send out commands to the robot. And now the second portion that we want to do is basically having a video comeback, which we haven't done yet. But this is the design that the students came up with. So there's some information that's going to be showing here, like water temperature, depth, voltage. Those are information coming back from sensors on the robot. And the video is supposed to show in the middle, and you're supposed to be able to take a snapshot if you see something interesting. They were supposed to actually have finished that last year, but there was a problem with the video because the Arduino couldn't take the video. It was too much for Arduino. We tried Raspberry Pi also. There was a, a delay. So even though they could do it, there was a delay. So we're going to be working on making it more effective in the next round. Another project was Hearing Loss Detector. So this is a collaboration with Bioengineering, another senior project. And the idea is to turn the phone into a hearing loss detector. So there is some kind of device called a audiometry device that kind of like plays sounds and you have, um, not sure if I have seen a little bit, basically you put a headphone and this device will play sounds and you're going to tell if you're listening to them or not. So it changes the range of frequency and, and, and it will tell you if you actually, how far off you are in the hearing range. 
So the students actually went around studying these devices and talked to some people, specialists in algeometry, and creating an app to substitute this device. So the idea is basically you are the phone plays the sound instead of the big algeometric kind of device, and the person is gonna you know say if could hear it or not. And eventually, after a broad range of things, you know, the phone is going to tell you if you are okay or not, and it's going to show you with a graph where you are in the hearing age range. Another device related to hearing is a hearing aid device. So this is inspired by SolarU. SolarU is um, one of the social enterprises that actually operates in Brazil and in Africa to deliver uh, affordable or inexpensive hearing aid device for people with a solar solar power battery. So inspired by that idea, you know, Gisuna came up with you know, an app to actually turn the phone into a hearing aid device. Basically the phone will amplify the sound and reduce the noise so that the person can actually hear. Of course, you know, you can think, who wants that? Isn't that easier to actually put a thing in your ear like everybody else does? Yeah, but a lot of people can't afford that. And you know, sometimes they can afford the battery. So this is supposed to actually help where you know the other device cannot make through. So this is again another research project it has to like study some of these devices and try to develop the app to adapt to that. Oh, for go on. So the first version of this was actually done for the Android. Now we're trying to actually kind of adapt that to the phone gap so that it actually can go into feature phones as well and, and be used by more more people. Uh, the last one here is Vocapet and Alalyze, which is also a collaboration in bioengineering. There is a professor in, in Santa Clara that actually has this research on analyzing vocal pattern, and that can actually tell you if you have some diseases. One of them is actually Parkinson. Another is basically vocal problems and things like that. So these students actually came up with this system to actually get, you know, record the voice of the person saying something like ah or something, and then basically this pattern goes to you know a back end where it does a lot of calculations and then brings back the information saying you know how your voice looks like in comparison to the baseline basically this is the idea you record a voice send it to a server and then the result goes back to a phone the last one is water contamination analyzer also collaboration with bioengineering the, the project here is about, is about identifying substances in the water. They did a set of, of sensors for arsenic, and they are working now in fluoride. So there are a bunch of different projects going on, and our job is basically to do the, the interface for that. So the whole idea is that a lot of people die because of drinking bad water in all over the world, actually. So, and they have to get the water, send water somewhere else to be tested, and bring it back the result. You know, but they are thirsty, they'll drink the water anyway. So if you actually have something that will show right away if the water is contaminated or not, that will be really helpful, and that's what this is all about. So basically, there are some sensors that will capture the level of contamination. We go through an electrical interface that we actually get a signal and turn that into a table of voltages that we actually read on the phone, and we're able to tell right away, you know, what's going on with the water. So we can show, this is an Android, we can show like that as a couple of, of curves. So the green curve is the baseline, the yellow one is the level of, of contamination. And that's our baseline, which means free. The pink one is the, the one we are targeting, and the aqua one is the level of contamination. So the difference between the yellow and the green will give you how contaminated the water is. And we're basically going to show right away a green or a red screen saying, yes to drink, not okay to drink, and on this part. And we also actually mark on a map, you know, the spots that actually have been kind of measured and that we know what is okay or not okay to drink. <coughs> okay, I only have two more minutes, so uh, I'm just gonna talk really fast about the projects that are going on right now, not a lot of details, so this summer we work with Oh, six actually solutions. social enterprises. One was Ezoko, which basically enable enable people in agricultural markets in Africa to communicate and exchange information. We actually they were complaining that the tax 
they send all the information through SMS, but they pay by SMS. So how do you decrease that? So we are coming up with like a compression library for them to make it basically decrease the number of facts that they are sending. So are you, I just talked about that. Here's the one that actually come up with with hearing devices, they're affordable. We're helping them with a, a system to gather information on the field. So they go around measuring people. They want to gather all that data. So we're helping to install, to deploy uh, a tool that actually help with that. Zikitsa is um, an emergency, emergency service in India. So they don't have 911. So these people came up with like a private 911. And we are coming up with an app that actually calls them and gives the location that they can come pretty fast. Sala Uno is about inexpensive cataract surgeries in Mexico. <coughs> and we are creating an SMS-based system to basically interact with the patients by sending them announcements about, you know, it's your time for a review, or it's time for you to come for a checkup, or, yeah, or you need to check that surgery again, something like that. So we are building that system for them. Nazava is basically providing water filters in Indonesia. And they have an interesting problem. Indonesia is a lot of islands, and they sell all over the place. But it's really hard for them to control the distribution. And they don't trust the people to actually enter information to send back. So the students actually building them an app directly. They'll take a picture of the receipt and bring that back instead of getting people to enter data because they want to enter all the data in the headquarters. So And everything is SMS because there's no Wi-Fi on some of the islands. Clinicas de Wazuka is basically a a social enterprise trying to help people in Mexico with diabetic, diabetic problems. So the students actually came up with a system for them to, to enable them to send educational material to them about diets and things like that. So the whole goal of the enterprise is to decrease the number of people with, with diabetes, but also to actually help people not to get there. So they are educating people instead of just treating them. That is my last one, just in time. So if you want more information and take a look at my project, this is the website where all the projects are described. And thanks for coming. Do students often have trouble programming for feature phones? Programming for feature phones? We use PhoneGap, which is a tool that actually enables you to program as if you're programming for a web page, but enables you to generate applications for lots of different phones. So, and that enables you to actually do for feature phones. It's a very cool tool and it's free, and you guys should try it out. Thank you. Yes? Could you repeat that? So, yeah, right now. We use this tool called PhoneGap. It's, a, it's an open source tool, it's free, you can download, and that enables you to actually make an app as if you were programming for the web with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and jQuery mobile. And you can pick, up, set up different platforms and generate an app for different platforms. That's what we've been using. Thank you. Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs>